This is Carl Palachuk, and you're listening to the SMB Community Podcast, produced by and for the Small Biz Thoughts community. We are dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. Hi, this is Carl Palachuk. Welcome to another SMB Community Podcast. I'm joined today by my long, long, long time friend, Vince Tinarello. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So, some folks should recognize your face. You seem to be in many, many places all the time. Uh, you end up on the stage a lot. Uh, so why don't you tell folks kind of uh, who you are and, and uh, how you got here? I'd be glad to. So again, Vince Tinarello, I run an MSP in Denver, Colorado, Anchor Network Solutions. And uh, we're about three and a half million dollars now and approaching 20 employees. Started in 2002 and thought that I just kind of wanted to run a little business by myself. And after I got three or four phone calls uh, riding my bike uh, on my way to my uh, wedding up in Vail, I decided I I did not want to be the on-call guy 24-7 and I needed to have staff. So kind of took off from there. Um, And and when I started my business, I, I spent time in the hospitality industry. I spent time with Marriott for... 10 plus years. And when I started working for a VAR that built white boxes and then fixed them, I realized quickly visiting clients that uh, technical staff, people in this business were just not very nice. And uh, (laughs) I thought to myself, I can do this better. You know, how do we bring hospitality skill, uh, customer service, you know, let's call it the Marriott way to to the IT business. So I wanted to bring that uh, into my consulting business. And so, yeah, that's just kind of how I got started. And I started attending conferences to try and learn as much as I can. And that led to involvement with organizations like CompTIA and being chair of the managed services community. And that led to involvement with Autotask and Datto. And and that's how I got to where I am. So I think it was Autotask must have been when I first met you. Yeah, there's a picture of us in... uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a bar in Caesars when Autotask was throwing a party. And uh, I think that's the one that like Puff Daddy was going to be at, that Autotask had the bar at first. <laughs> but it, before that, weren't you part of the original grumpy old men? Totally. Absolutely. The grumpy old I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You, me, Andy Harper. Um, we had a couple others. That's right. Yeah, yeah, Sherman. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's a whole, there's a handful of us that are still around. Uh, so anyway, so that's all good fun. Um, and you have also, uh, in addition to CompTIA, you've done the peer group thing. Uh, so that is one of the things where it's, it's somebody should always be doing something. Uh, I talk to so many people who are isolated. You know, they run their business by themselves and bemoan the fact that that they don't know how people do this and how people grow. Uh, and then they go on Reddit and they ask other people who uh, are sitting alone in their basement trying to figure it out. And it's just, there's just a better way to communicate with successful partners. Yeah, there, there are. Uh, well, there definitely is. And uh, several ways, obviously, at the, attending you know, the conferences and looking for thought leadership Um, which is very important to me. And and I should add, you you mentioned something about the stage. Um, Jay McBain was on, you know, one of your podcasts recently, and I'll never forget. He said to me, you should introduce yourself as, hi, my name is Vince Tinarello and I'm a failure. And, and it's pretty funny because I, he's right. What I I always um, am conscious of with presentations and conferences is that um, I used to sit in the audience and go, oh, my gosh, that guy's up there. He knows so much more than I do. He's smart. I'm dumb. And I just want to get to where he is. And so um, you and I have done some Channel Pro stuff together. And I always like to make sure people know, I don't know what I'm doing any more than anyone else. You know, it's a new day every day, a new journey. And I'm learning how to do this better. And that's, that's I'm trying to share what I've succeeded at, share what I failed at. I would never want to sit in front of anyone and say, I am an absolute expert in this, but I, if I can help people, which is really where, what it comes down to, if I can help people avoid the pitfalls that I've made and, and shortcut to success, I'd like to do that. And so part of the way, you know, one of the ways you do that is by being part of a peer group. And I joined an MSP Ignite peer group several years ago 
where Steve Alexander heard me at a CompTIA event. He was behind me and heard me saying, well, to Andy Harper and I think to Chris Johnson, why don't we just start our own peer group? And, and Steve leaned over and said, because you'll never hold each other accountable. And then we, we got together as a group and said, well, how do we formalize this thing? And it has been business, business changing. Cool. Well, I have been in the uh, HTG, in Taylor Business Groups, uh, other organizations. They are all phenomenal, you know, and, and a piece of it really is the holding other people accountable, you know, and you think, well, that's not really my job, right? I don't make money holding strangers accountable or, you know, even friends who just happen to own a business. But the reality is when you mastermind with people, when you exchange ideas, if you ask a question and Andy answers it and I'm listening, I get that knowledge. You know, I, even if it's not my current problem that's being addressed, it's certainly going to be a future problem, right? So it's, a, it's always good advice and it's always good to, to open your ears and figure out how other people are solving problems. Agreed. And, you know, the, it's the same old story, you know, you get out of it what you give. And it's led to some other things that we've tried to do at CompTIA, where in the managed services community, I'm, I'm now the past chair and, and, and Charles Love is the chair. We try to um, change our educational sessions. So it wasn't just about a panel discussion and these people must be the experts. It's like, well, how do we get, how do we get the audience to be the expert? How do we involve them? And a few of the sessions that I tried to facilitate, you know, I'd find people I knew in the audience, I'd find Amy Babinchak and I'd, I'd go right to her with a question. It's like, you answer this, right? <laughs> let's get people involved and let's all help each other. And so then that's led to some things that we did with Autotask and now at DattoCon of an entire peer forum track where we literally have impromptu peer group meetings. And some of the most genius advice I've learned even from people in other markets. I, always, I love to point out the Dutch. You know, the Dutch uh, do things a very distinct way and getting advice from them on how they run their service desk. Uh, it, it's just been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm always learning. And you travel a bit. Who pays for all that? Um, you know, when it's a vendor-sponsored event, they do. Uh, when I, I'm try, I've tried to cut down on my travel and I realize that uh, people will... As much as you're willing to give, they'll take. Um, but I've cut down my travel to uh, two Datto cons where I participate and I work at the event. And then I, I've cut it down to the, at least one CompTIA event and then my peer group events. So I, you know, when, it, when it's vendor sponsored, they pay for it. You know, just like when going to Channel Pro, they pay for me to be there. But, um, you know, I foot the bill for the ones where I'm an attendee. Right. Um, all right, let me switch gears big, big time. So on, on the personal side, you, uh, you have this project to climb every mountain on earth. And um, but what a lot of people don't know if, you haven't, if they haven't been to the Rockies is you can't actually name all the, all the peaks in the Rockies. Uh, I think some of them just have numbers. Um, but but you, you finished a project to climb like whatever, is it the 49 points or something well so there was there's there were officially at one point the numbers changed 53 peaks above 14,000 feet that were named and to meet that official list they had to have uh, 3,000 feet of vertical gain from the base and they had to rise at least 300 feet from their adjoining summit right there's a saddle in between two peaks and so I set out to climb all of those. And then as time went on, uh, that number increased. I don't know how, because the mountains were there and they changed some of the rules. And now it appears Vogue to just climb, there are 58 that are named and above 14,000 feet that may not meet the criteria of vertical gain from the saddle. So I just said, you know what? I don't want any asterisks. So I'm just going to climb them all. <laughs> and, and so I did. I completed that goal a couple of years ago. And now I'm doing some repeats, taking up friends, taking up people from my gym and trying different approaches, different routes. But the, the number one goal I did uh, accomplish a couple years ago. So now bring it back to business. 
How has that got anything to do with your business and, and your success? I think um, that's a really interesting question and not one I've, I've thought about before, but aside from goal setting, I mean, you, there's, there's different aspects to that. One, set out a goal, write it down, which is what I did, and, and then it update it every year with specific peaks that I'm going to do. And we all know when you write it down, you set a goal, you make it happen. And uh, you told people about it. You told I did. Them, right? I did. Yeah. Uh, that way people would hold me accountable and ask me questions about it. And, and it wasn't from a bragging perspective of like, hey, look at what I'm doing. It's I want to do this. You know, it's important to me. I, it's, a, it's a goal of mine. And I'd say also from a business perspective, um, it, ha it gives me uh, time to think. You know, if you read EOS or the traction books, they talk about clarity breaks, time away from the business to think. And when, you know, when you're walking six miles to the summit of a mountain, it sure as heck gives you time to think. Right. I, I find that I solve problems I can't solve in the office when I'm out in mother nature. It is interesting because a lot of people will, they'll make the connection about <clears throat> achieving something very specific they'll lose the, the, how it's connected that you also take time away from your business. And it's not like you never think about your business. You just clear your brain. And I, I think when you do stuff like that, uh, the clarity leaves room for other stuff. I'm a, I'm a big believer in leaving flow size chunks in your schedule. You know, some people stack up their schedule like dominoes. And then when one thing goes wrong, it's ruined their day, their week, and maybe their month. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I mean, I, I tell friends, like, don't, which is why I've kind of backed off a little bit, candidly, on social media. Um, don't mistake me doing fun things for not working hard or enough, ever. Um, I may wait, work nine hours straight so I can leave an hour early and work right through lunch so that I can get on my mountain bike and I've had issues that I couldn't solve all darn day and I get out on my mountain bike and, 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 it, and it comes to me instantly. Right. And you've got to have things outside of the business or it will burn you out. You have to get away from it and do other things away from technology. Put it aside and it'll give you so much clarity. And it's, it's unbelievable. Well, you know, uh, in Relax, Focus, Succeed, I always talk about, you know, making sure that you take time to recharge your batteries. And... Um, I, I work with people and I work with some very big companies where the owners simply still believe that you can keep working people 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week nonstop and that it's only going to make you more money uh, and that, you know, they don't see that it's, it's burning people out and it's giving poor support and, you know, it's just like there's literally nothing good about it after a certain point. Yeah, I, I agree. And one of the things I like to ask people when I meet them, um, I, I recall asking this question to some colleagues of mine uh, who worked at, at uh, Autotask. And I said, what do you like to do for fun? And a couple of them couldn't answer that question right away because they were so focused on, on work and their job and the mission and the task at hand. And one of them came to me later and said, you threw me for a loop for that question and it really made me think about where I stood in my life of I don't really know what I like to do for fun. And it's so important because your work does not define you. It, sh it should not define you. Not 100%, right? Not 100%. Well, I think a lot of us get into this business, especially technology, because we like techie things. We like toys. We like to, you know, I mean... Even today, the newer technologies, robotics and droids, and, you know, CompTIA has got a whole new droid thing. And I don't know if you sat in on their meeting recently, but um, there's so many cool things that people are doing. Um, and, you know, and that's what life should be, right? Your, your job and your work should be related to each other. But it's still the case that if you're on that job, even if you love it, 70 hours a week, <laughs> you're, you're, you're burning out at least at one end, if not both ends. Well, you know, the, some of the best, I, I agree, the best advice I was ever given when I was trying to transition from the hotel business was a, from an old boss who said, you've got to figure out what you love to do and then how to get paid at it. And back then I was like, all right, well, nobody's going to climb me to uh, pay me to climb mountains. 
Uh, nobody's going to pay me to ski. Nobody's going to pay me to mountain bike. And I'm a terrible golfer. So what's next? Well, I love technology. So how do I find a job in technology that, that, that fits? And yeah, for sure. You've got to do what you love, um, but make sure you've got work-life balance. Every time when I read, you know, relax, focus, succeed, and talking about business hours and then small business thoughts, you know, I agree 100%. You know, sure, you have the occasional downtime, but you should not have to work after hours all the time. It should not be necessary if you're doing it right. Well, it's also the case that, you know, every once in a while, something happens in your personal life or somebody's who's close to you personal life and you realize uh, it ain't all about work. You know, at some point you have to lead your life because, you know, you never know when it's over all of a sudden, you know. Agreed. So um, on the Marriott thing, you and I have had, uh, actually we've talked about this on a podcast before. Um, I love the fact that you draw on that experience and, uh, you know, I'm, they, they've changed the program since you worked there. Uh, I'm now Marriott Titanium. I saw that. <laughs> it's, it's so absurd that even the employees can't say it with a straight face. So, Agreed. Yeah, it is silly. You know, like platinum was platinum, and that was that. Now, this, there should not be a titanium. Well, it, you know, they, once, once they gobble up other brands and try to put them all together, uh, they got to have a point system that makes everybody feel like they're the big winner. So, yeah. Oh. Anyway, so let's go back to the beginning. So you mentioned that that experience helped you see how bad some people are in this business at uh, actually giving support at giving customer service. So how did, what did you do in your business to make it a little more uh, Marriott like? First and foremost, set the example for everyone else on how we talk to people, how we treat people. Uh, I made some talking points with employees in terms of, and gave a presentation that I gave at a conference to my own team of, Hey, here's what it was like in the hotel business. And here's, here are the, issues we dealt with, which are not that different from what we deal with in our business. Um, and so I gave examples of how we took care of customers and what our expectation was. I don't know that we'll ever be the Ritz Carlton or the JW brands or Four Seasons, but I'd like to be the Marriott West and Hyatt and the principles are similar. And then I like to point out that if you can get a 15 year old at Chick-fil-A and do it over and over and over to say with a smile, it's my pleasure, we can certainly do the same thing with our clients and that that is my, my expectation. Now, we all know it's challenging. You can either hire people for people skills or, or technical and technical skills. It's in the MSP business, it's hard to find both. Usually you have to give one up over the other, but I'm finding there's a healthy balance if you provide the basics in terms of, of training and setting expectations. Right, well, it's also, you end up building the company that you want to work at, right? That That's right. You hire people that you enjoy being with and you, you know, teach them how to talk to each other and to clients. And, you know, it seems, you know, sometimes it seems like we're talking down to technicians or about technicians when we say that they're nerdy or they don't have people skills, but kind of at some level, nobody does until somebody tells them this is the way that we greet people. This is the way that we explain what we do, you know? And, and so I, I like the idea of giving them some kind of a script, you know? Uh, we always had a thing we called the first visit where we literally would script out exactly what would be said and what would be done on the first visit. And that way it's successful and technicians begin to see that it really does make a difference versus walking in saying, I'll be at the server and then they disappear. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Building rapport, asking questions, smiling, you know, you're right. I mean, gosh, any, uh, any 18 year old that has a phone in their hand and you try and introduce yourself to them and they're looking at their phone as you're, you know, you've got your, your hand extended, to shake hands with them. It's not just about technicians as humans right now. We're, we're losing our interpersonal skills and it's, it's, uh, it's a little frightening. Um, well, you know, what's interesting though about the Marriott thing is I, I think some of it's a little function of getting old and cranky. Uh, and I say that tongue in cheek, but, um, you know, reading the book, the pumpkin plan, I, we've, we've developed a client assessment chart with a bunch of criteria, 
Some of them are uh, around, do we cringe when the phone rings? Do they forgive slip ups? Do they engage with us? Um, I think it's really important to demonstrate to staff that we will not tolerate jerks, um, that money is not more important and that we have criteria. And while at Marriott, while we were taught the customer was always right, we all know the customer isn't always right. We just have right. to find a way to handle the situation professional, uh, professionally and appropriately. And then teach our, our staff that they are empowered. Um, the, uh, the guy, T Tim Ferriss, who I think is a little crazy, but wrote the four hour work week, talked about how he had a call center selling nutritional supplements and they, they were bombarding him, the, 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 the customer service people for every client inquiry. And finally he's like, you know what, here's a budget. If it's less than this, give it, just make a decision. Right. And, and at Marriott, if, a, if you talk to a bellman and said you were unhappy with something, they could comp your room. Anybody could comp a room. You, you wouldn't get yelled at or scolded. You might, if it was the wrong decision, you would get coached. But I think um, in dealing with customers now these days too, making sure our teams feel empowered to make the right decision for, for the customer and for us is, is paramount. One of the most important things we could do. And it diffuses situations. Right. Well, uh, so I have on a bulletin board to my left, uh, one of my favorite phrases, which is branding is everything you do. And when I talk about that, I use Marriott as one of my examples, right? Marriott is not a logo. It, it's not, uh, you know, a little thing that <laughs> fits on a button. Uh, it's not, not on the back of a, the, a card. Um, it is how you are greeted, how you are treated, you know, what happens when you ask a question, what happens when you have an unusual request. And it's the same thing with us, like the way that you talk to clients, the way you talk to each other, the way your employees um, show respect for themselves and for uh, clients, you know, on and on and on. Every single thing you do is part of your brand. And uh, once people see that, then I think instead of seeing all of this as a bunch of little rules that you have to follow, they see it as like, oh, this is the road to success. <laughs> yeah, the way, that's the way we do things here. It'll be interesting to see how that company evolves as they've employed technology, right? And the, the, the traditional front desk is now a podium and not a behind, behind the desk. And, you know, you can check yourself in. Well, you know, for me, I'm old school. Part of the process that I enjoy is the greeting when you check into the hotel. Um, it's really fascinating to see how that, that will that, uh, change over time. And when I think about trying to get 20 people in my little company to do things the same way, I'm fascinated when I look back at Marriott of how they indoctrinated me on, this is, this is the way we do things here. This is the Marriott way. And I just got it. And everybody there, for the most part, just gets it. Right, well, I think there's some sense that if you actually have a way, if you have a specific, whether it's, you know, this is the anchor network's way of doing things or uh, whatever, uh, that people come in and they say, you know, this really is a little bit better than the competition. This is a little bit higher level stuff. And so if they're not sure what the way is, then they can ask and say, how do we handle this situation? And knowing that they can't just make shit up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. There's norms, right? It becomes norms and then your employees self-police it. And you don't even have to. It gets taken care of by itself. Well, it's also, it fills in the gaps because let's say you can document 90% of what you should be doing. Well, then you get to the other 10%. It's like, okay, well, what's consistent with our brand? What's consistent with the way that we market, the way that we uh, talk to people, the way we document, you know, back things up, da 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 And they come to a de decision that is most of the time, very consistent with the way that Vince would have done it if he was there. Yep, agree. So what's ahead for you? You've got the, the Datto thing. So talk a little bit about what you do with that peer forum track. So I, I, it excites me a, a great deal. And we, we started it at Autotask Community Live where uh, the idea was, okay, you go to conferences and you hear over and over, yeah, the content was good, but I got more value when I was having a beer with Carl in the bar and we were, you know, shooting the breeze and talking business. That's why I, that's why I learned more and kind of got this concept of, well, why do we have to wait until midnight or 10 PM at the, in the bar to get strong value? 
Um, how do we get value in some of the sessions as well? Increase the value. Otherwise, you know, there's a lot of recycling of the same content. And that's, that's like at every conference, right? I mean, how many times do we go to a conference and we hear, hey, let's talk about pricing again. And we're like, oh, enough, right? So the idea was, let's try and form a, an impromptu, have loose topics and have impromptu peer meetings, peer groups. And uh, we tried them and test piloted them at Autotask Community Live, and they became the highest rated sessions of the event. And then I, uh, when Data and Autotask merged, I begged Rob Ray to allow me to do them there, to try them there. And he, he said, well, how on earth are we gonna ask people to fly across the country, go sit in a meeting room and tell them, yeah, we don't know, really know what you're gonna talk about. <laughs> But there'll be value in it. And he took the leap of faith to his credit. And we did them and tried them in Austin. And they were some of the highest rated sessions. And people couldn't get in the room. Uh, they, were, and they, they were just overflowing. So we continued them at San Diego. We ran them in Barcelona. And now we have them on the agenda in Paris. And it's, it's been just a, a great success. We try to keep them to about 20 people. And I think the key is, uh, especially in terms of facilitation, is making sure that you're not speaking because if you're speaking then you're a speaker and right. even though you know the answer it's it's the skill is to get people in the room talking about what keeps them up at night and what do they need help with in their business and allowing peers to share ideas and help solve problems and so that's how we how we got from uh, you know just the starting point a few years back in Miami at Community Live to where we are now at DattoCon and they just keep scaling them and adding more sessions. It's been fun. Very cool. So I take it that means you're going to Paris. I am going to Paris. Yes, and we'll. Uh, I'm trying to really extend, uh, basically replicate Vince and, and in terms of facilitation. Really, what I'm focusing on now is making sure that the attendee gets the same experience from session to session. So we've got topics like, you know, uh, client engagement, uh, CIO, we have business strategy, we have service delivery, and we're, now we're narrowing the focus. There's one on M&A, things of that nature, and it's, it's fun. We're trying to scale them and, and introduce new topics. And so, yes, I will be in Atlanta uh, next year for DadoCon. I will be in Paris in October as well. So are you taking your wife to Paris? I am, uh, as a matter of fact, my family is joining me after the event. It's the first time we've ever done such a thing because usually I'm like, you do not want to come to this conference with me unless you want me rolling in at one o'clock in the morning right. after drinking a bunch of beers and waking you all up. <laughs> so they, I'm like, you don't want to come. No matter how cool the location is, you don't want to come. Uh, to Paris, they're going to take, uh, the girls happen to have a few days off from school right at that same time. Uh, they're not going to be at the hotel. They are going to be elsewhere, and I'm going to join them after the event. My cool. uh, my nine year old just desperately wants to see uh, the Eiffel Tower. Has Eiffel Tower earrings, a shirt that says Paris. It, it's always a good time for Paris. She's got a fascination with it, so we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. Very very cool. All right. Well, thank you, sir. I always appreciate having you on and uh, catching up with you. So, uh, you know. Where, where is, what's next? Is Datocon next or, or Paris? Datocon is next. Um, and, and it's always good to catch up with you too. I wish we uh, saw each other more and really appreciate you having me on and the consideration. But uh, yeah, the next thing for me event wise from between now and then is, is Datocon, a couple of mountains to climb in the meantime on, on personal time and, and more peer group stuff. So yeah, keeping busy. Very good. Well, Vince Tinerol, thank you for being here. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for tuning in to the SMB Community Podcast. If you found this useful, interesting, or fun, please subscribe, share with your friends, and give us a thumbs up on your favorite social media. Please check out the show notes at smbcommunitypodcast.com and give us your feedback.